Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my lecture number 24. Today I would like to introduce you to the great properties of photovoltaics. At the beginning I would like to spend a few minutes on physics so that you understand how photovoltaics basically works. I cannot go into very much details because it's a very complicated subject, but in this lecture today I would like to explain you the basic principles. So this here is a photovoltaic cell. I guess most of you have seen something like that already. There's a big variety of photovoltaic technology and I cannot explain everything, but I will show you the basics. So how does photovoltaics work? Up to now we studied wind and solar power. And in both cases there, the energy is generated in a generator who is rotated by a turbine or something similar. In photovoltaics, this is very different. This is a way of producing electrical power using semiconductors or similar things. So there's no motion, there's nothing rotating and still there's electricity coming out. So how does a photovoltaic cell look like? Well, basically on the top and of the bottom of this photovoltaic cell, you have electrodes, which means there's some metal or something where the electrical current can flow through. And to this photovoltaic cell then where the electricity is coming out, you just connect a load. This is what the user has to do. How does it work inside? Well, the basic principle is that you have an active substrate and this active substrate is hit by light. And as soon as the light goes in, there are some reactions happening and these reactions produce electricity. How does it work? For that you have to understand a little bit how matter is made inside. And from school you have all learned that matter is made out of atoms and atoms have a positive nucleus and a negative cloud of electrons. To simplify this picture, let's have a solid block of material made out of positive nucleons and only one electron around. In reality, you have more electrons, but most of the electrons are tightly bound to the nucleus so that they somehow don't count for these processes. So imagine there's one electron which has the ability to react with photons. If now a photon is coming in, it goes through part of the material. So the material has to be more or less transparent for photons, but not really because the photon should be absorbed in the material after some micrometers, for example. What happens? Well, a photon, when it is absorbed by an atom, it means that the electron is excited. So the energy of the photon goes over to the electron and then the electron can be freed from the nucleus and possibly it becomes some kinetic energy. This is shown in the next picture. So here the photon hits the electron. The electron is moved, in this case, upwards. What happens now with the material? Well, at the position where there was the electron before, there is no electron anymore. And instead, the electron moves up to the next atom, for example, or to one of the other atoms. And here is where you, in principle, start to need quantum mechanics, but you can, in a more naive way, also explain it in the picture here, what happens is naturally that in the area where there is now this additional electron, there's a negative charge because there's one more electron than there are nuclei. And below there's a hole, there's one electron missing. So this material will be a little bit positive. And instead of saying it's positive because of the atomic nuclei, where there's more positive charge than there are electrons to compensate. Instead, the physicists then say at this position there is a hole and this hole is positive. Yeah, this doesn't really make sense at the first sight, but it's a very useful picture. So what happened is when the electron excites the material, the substrate, what can happen is that there's a ne negative electron moving upwards and a positive hole is moving downwards. So these yellow dots somehow give the overall charge of the substrate. So there's this negative up and this positive down. What happens next? Well, 
the electron continues to move upwards or it gives the energy to a second electron and the second electron moves upwards and the hole is filled by an electron coming from some other side and then there is a hole somewhere at another position. So again you view it in the way that the electron has a negative charge moving upwards and the hole has a positive charge moving downwards. And this continues until at some point the electron is at the upper surface and the positron at the lower surface and then the electron can be collected by the electrodes and flow through the metal wire and on the other side where there is a positive hole an electron from the electrode can go into the substrate and this way then the hole is filled so a negative charge is moved upwards or in other words a positive charge flows away through the electrodes in this naive picture. And exactly that is what is happening in the substrate. So here again the picture of the photovoltaic cell. The active substrate is in between these electrons. The upper electrode has to be transparent so that the light can go through. And then when the light is absorbed, it excites these electron hole pairs, how you say it in physics. And these electron hole pairs then move through the substrate and they move to the electrodes and then they are collected at the electrodes. But sometimes of course it happens that an electron and a hole fit together inside of the substrate so they recombine the energy is freed as heat energy then. And of course the power of this electron is lost for the application. So this explains why there is electrical current flowing out of the electrode. Of course that doesn't explain everything. You might have the question going back to the other picture for example. Why are the electrons move to one direction and the holes to the other direction? This has to do with internal electrical fields in the substrate. This would go too far for this lecture. Maybe at another lecture I can explain that in more detail. So this is the simplest model of a photovoltaic cells explaining how the basic principle is. But nowadays there is a huge research program going on since many many years now to improve these cells and to find better material to have better efficiencies. And exactly that is shown here on this diagram. This shows your plot starting in 1975 until today. And the vertical scale here is the cell efficiency. So from close to zero, it rises up. And on the right side here, you see that the highest efficiencies that have been shown today are about 47%. So there has been a great progress in the last decades about increasing the efficiencies. Just a few words now to the different substrates which are being used. The most major technology are silicon cells. A lot of these silicon cells are made with single crystals, but you can also use silicon heterostructures and thin film crystals. Silicon is a semiconductor which is very well known from uh, semiconductor electronics and there's a lot of experience here and a lot of the photovoltaic cells which you can actually buy for your roof for example they are made out of silicon but there are also other semiconductors for example gallium arsenide junctions can be used also in thin films or in single crystals then there are all kind of different materials amorphous and crystalline and um, nowadays there's a big program also running on organic cells and a rather new technology uses perovskite cells. So from the names already you hear you can have all kind of materials unorganic and organic. There are dyes being used because dyes are needed to absorb all kind of colors of the solar light and from the names you also understand that a lot of those things are poisonous like if you talk about uh, cadmium cells or arsenic junctions, you see already that it makes a difference only to produce the best efficiencies or to produce a photovoltaic cells which you then can produce in large scale without poisoning the environment. 
just before I explain to you the physics principles, so there is always an excitation of electron hole pairs. And these excitations depend on the photon energy. So in principle, if you have a fixed photon energy, which means a fixed wavelength of the light, a fixed color, then you can optimize your solar cell for this color. But of course, we would like to absorb all the solar spectrum and therefore you would of course like to have a photovoltaic cells which can absorb all wavelengths. And to do that, and this is normally not possible if you have just one substrate, instead you need junctions of several substrates, so different kind of junctions, and therefore you need layers of photovoltaic cells, so-called multi-junction cells, they allow to have a higher efficiency for a lot of wavelengths, not only for one. And therefore, if you want to have very efficient photovoltaic cells, you need rather complex solar cells with these multi-junctions for different wavelengths. I do not want to go deeper into the physics and the technology which is used. But one more thing to say is most of the solar cells have to be done using semiconductor technology, which means you need very clean rooms to do that. And it's a rather complicated technology. However, there is a development of new solar cells, especially the organic solar cells. They are much simpler to produce and some of them you can even use like a paint. So you can paint some substrate and then your substrate becomes a photovoltaic cells using this paint as active material. So there's a lot of development and there's a lot of hope for the future to improve that even more. Now I would like to go from the simple cell to a photovoltaic system. So there's more needed than just a photovoltaic cell. And this is shown here in this diagram. So you have the solar cell, which is the physics active material. This has an upper and a lower connection with electrodes. Then from that you produce a solar module. So this sometimes very sensitive and fragile solar cells are put into a frame, which has normally a glass window on top and some metal below. It all has to be connected. Normally it's connected all in a row. And then you have a solar module which you can buy in a shop. And from this solar module then you can make a big solar panel with a lot of modules. And then if you have a big roof, you put a lot of these solar panels on your roof or on your field. And then you have your photovoltaic system. And this then has connections of the individual panels. And also here you connect them either all in a row or you have a parallel connection to it, depending on all kind of things you have to keep in mind. This is not our main business now. But then the question is how to connect such a solar system. Well, here's a nice drawing which shows it. So it starts with the modules on the roof, for example. They are connected in row or in parallel. The electricity which comes out there is DC, yeah, direct current, because all the photovoltaic cells have a positive and a negative sides because the electrons always move to one side and the holes to the other side. If you now connect a lot of them in a row and each photovoltaic cell has typically one to two volts, then you can get very high voltages from that. And this high DC voltage then, if you want to use it at home, then has to be converted into alternating current. The modules which make AC out of DC are called inverters. So they convert, for example, 400 volt DC electricity in, for example, 230 volt AC, which you then can use at home. This AC network can then either be just locally in your own home. Then to have electricity, in addition, you need a battery to store the electricity during the day to use it overnight. Or you connect everything to the grid. Then, of course, you can use the grid at night and during day you feed your own photovoltaics power into the grid. And on my roof, for example, I have 
just this kind of system. I don't have a battery and I have a meter. Actually, I have two meters. One meter counts all the time when I feed my electricity into the grid and I get paid for that. And a second meter measures all the times when I take electricity out of the grid in the evening, for example, and then I have to pay for it. Of course, the amount of money which I get when I feed electricity into the grid is much less per kilowatt hour than the amount of electricity I have to pay at night when I get the electricity back. But still, it's not worth for me at the moment to buy a battery because they are still quite expensive. This AC-DC converter are also some electronics devices which are non-trivial because you have to keep in mind that the electricity which you feed into the grid has a 50 Hertz alternating current and this 50 Hertz frequency has to be exactly matched by my inverter because it has to be in phase at a certain phase angle because otherwise the electricity does not fit into the grid. But this is all done electronically and with modern electronics this is not a problem. If I have no electricity from the grid, the problem is that then the inverter doesn't work because it cannot synchronize with the grid and then I have no electricity. So if there's a power failure in Gießen in my town, then even though I have photovoltaic and I have in principle enough power for myself, I cannot use this power because the typical inverters which you can buy in Germany don't work standalone, they only work when they are connected to the grid. Of course, there are different inverters where this works also in a standalone version, and this is of course very important. If you don't have a grid at all, or if you have a very small grid and everything is powered by photovoltaics. Now let's come to some more diagrams. Here you see a nice diagram about the exponential growth of solar power. So there is really a great progress in photovoltaics. It starts in 1992 and goes up to 2018. And you see in this diagram, this is a linear rise. You have to keep in mind that this is a half logarithmic scale, which means that horizontally it's a linear scale where the years are and vertically where the power is, the gigawatt, this is a logarithmic scale. So it's a logarithmic growth, which means that every few years the amount of electricity doubles. So if you look at the diagram, it's about, I would say, every six or seven years, the amount of photovoltaic is growing by a factor of 10. So this, of course, cannot go on like that all the time. But at the moment, there's no saturation yet. And a factor of 10 every six or seven years is really great. Nobody would have predicted that 20 years ago. And actually, the predictions are even worse. So on the diagram here on the right, you see the International Energy Agency had every year predictions in the World Economic Outlook. And every year, they somehow predicted that there's no rise of photovoltaics anymore and the reality looks really different. So you can now of course ask what is the reason why the prediction are so wrong, but this is also not our subject here today. Another plot which is also quite interesting is the solar cell production showing here behind me. So the solar cell production also increases exponentially and you see not only that, but most of the photovoltaic production comes from China, including Taiwan. But also Europe and Japan and North America are strong in that. And there are more and more countries coming, which also produce their own photovoltaic cells. This diagram shows here what's called the Swenson's law, but in principle it's nothing special here in photovoltaic. We all know that there's a property in industry which you can call the reduction by large numbers. As soon as you produce a lot of things, people find a lot of ways to produce it cheaper. And exactly that is what is happening in photovoltaics here. So this is a double logarithmic plot and in this double logarithmic plot the photovoltaic 
prices go down almost linear. So that means whenever you produce a factor of 10 more of these modules, then the price goes down by a certain factor. And this is the reason why photovoltaics is so cheap nowadays. A similar curve you know from computing also there. The computing power grows with the number of computers produced. Also the computer storage has a similar curve where also the prices per bit go down in a similar way. So this diagram here shows you the prices of PV cells. It started in the 70s with $76 per watt of peak power and now it's below 30 US cents. And if you convert these prices into the production of electricity, there the best prices from this year is that in Abu Dhabi there's been a power station produced in the desert where the guaranteed electricity price by the company is 1.2 euro cent per kilowatt hours. So it's really cheap. So we are approaching now this one cent limit for the kilowatt hour. And this is much cheaper than any other way to produce electricity. It's cheaper than coal and oil. And um, only wind is also going into this direction. The best price, of course, can only be reached in the best areas. So Abu Dhabi is in an area where there's a lot of solar power, but there are other areas, for example, Australia, where there's a similar solar power. For example, in Chile, it's even better, but also in Mexico and in certain areas in the US and in China, and of course, in North of Africa, there are everywhere regions, especially those in the deserts where you can reach this prices of about one cent per kilowatt hours in future. Now we are almost at the end of the lecture already. I want to show you a few technologies how to apply photovoltaics. A first example shows you the rooftop photovoltaics. So you can really do it everywhere. Even if you are in an area where there is no electricity connection, then with photovoltaic and some storage, you can have your electricity at home. Then there are huge photovoltaic fields in many areas in the world nowadays already. And another way to put photovoltaics is to put it at the sides of buildings, not only on the roof. Normally, of course, you put it to the southern side because this has the strongest insulation on the northern half of the planet. But actually, it makes sense that you all have part of your photovoltaics also in east or west direction because then you get your peak power in the morning or in the evening. And this is of course very useful because in the summer in these areas where there's a lot of photovoltaics there's typically at noon too much solar power. But in the morning and in the evening this doesn't help and therefore you also want to have part of your photovoltaics directed to, to the east or to the west. You can put photovoltaics on boats and on planes and all that also works. Of course, for a normal plane which has to go with high speed and a lot of weight, photovoltaics is not useful. This is just an illustration project where people wanted to show that you can fly over a long distance only with solar power but of course then you have to have a very light plane at a very low speed. If you want to get more power out of your photovoltaic cells what you can do is you can do solar tracking so you mount your solar cells on a movable device which follows the sun then you always have the optimum angle to produce electricity. Of course this means additional costs and maintenance because of the solar tracking, you have movable parts and you have to have different stands. So I think nowadays this is not the best option anymore for most of us because of solar cells themselves became so cheap that it's more cost effect to mount a few more photovoltaic cells on a fixed mount instead of having this tracking system. But if you have a tracking system, you can in addition use concentration of solar light. 
You all have seen the lecture about the concentrated solar power where you have concentrating mirrors to produce higher temperatures. Here if you have photovoltaic cells, what you do instead is you put some lenses in front, some cheap plastic lenses, and behind this array of lenses which you see on the picture, there are then very small photovoltaic cells. So you need very little area for the photovoltaic cells. You save a lot of money this way. And in addition, you can buy very expensive, very efficient photovoltaic cells for this small area. So they get a lot of light in the focus of the lenses. And this way you can have a very efficient way to have photovoltaics. Also here it's again a question of price if you want to do it or not because here, of course, you have in addition the costs for these lenses, which are not so expensive, but you have to have a precise tracking system. And the concentrated photovoltaics makes only sense if you have a clear sky, because they can only catch the direct light of the sun, whereas a normal flat photovoltaic panel also gets the light which comes from the clouds and from the whole sky. At the end, two more pictures. This shows you a roof and this is a picture done by an infrared camera. So the infrared camera shows you the temperature of the modules on the roof. And there you see there are some modules which are quite warm, the red ones, which have 37 degrees. This is probably the normal operation temperature of the photovoltaic modules. And the upper half of the roof is not warm, which means this is not functional. And the reason why it's not functional can also be seen in the picture. You see these red spots there in the second row of in the roof. So these red spots are probably problems with wiring or photovoltaic modules which produce a lot of heat. And due to this failure of this one module with the red spots, Probably the current connection of all the others is disconnected, so there's no electricity flying through the module. Because probably the upper two rows are connected in one row electrically. And if there's one problem in the line, then the whole row is dead. Something like that happened also on my roof. I had shown you my roof before. Also here electrically I have two parts. One part is connected in parallel and the second part of the roof is also connected in parallel. And on my roof, one of the modules was hit by lightning. This shows you that part of the module was destroyed by the lightning. Therefore, there was no electricity going through anymore. And then half of the roof could not take any energy anymore. So I, for some time, I could only run the half of my photovoltaic modules because everything was connected in a row. If we go back to the warm temperatures, of course, it can in principle also happen that something burns down or that for another reason uh, the house is burning. The problem with photovoltaics then is that due to the electricity production, there are rather quite high voltages in the modules and then if the firemen can come and they put water on it, that can be, of course, in principle, dangerous for the fireman. Therefore, modern photovoltaic plants have a mechanism to switch off the individual modules so that there's no high voltage happening anymore. But this is a question of how to connect the photovoltaics and if there are switches to switch it off or not. So with this impressions of photovoltaics and what all is possible nowadays. I want to finish this lecture today. Thank you for listening again and next time we will have another interesting subject again. Goodbye.